Okay, so we're now up to section six of the syllabus that animals that produce vibrations also have organs to detect, detect vibrations. So buying, barking, coughing, humming, laughing, saying, screeching, talking, uttering, whinging and yelling are just some ways that humans describe the noises made by animals when communicating. But the reasons for producing these sounds can be almost as varied. Coordination, contentment, cold, distress, echolocation, fear, group cohesion, hunger, migration, predation, etc. This little video is a bit of fun showing a couple of different ways that animals communicate. <laughs> Cicadas, for example, produce sounds that are so loud, 120 decibels, that it can be painful to the human ear. The volume is equivalent to thunder, a jet plane, or even a chainsaw. The main purpose of their songs is to find a mate. As cicadas are communal species, the sound can be used to ward off predators, and because they are singing in a group, it is more difficult to locate individuals. The deafening sound may also help to interfere with the predator's communication. Since many fish sounds are associated with reproduction, their noise is often used by researchers to measure the time and the place of spawning. Dolphins are known to hone in on sound-producing fish, and dolphins' whistles have been known to suppress the chorus of some fish species. Frogs croak for a variety of reasons, such as attracting a mate, marking their territory, and distress, such as pain or fright. Male birds have special calls for attracting mates as well as warding off other males or predators. Males inhabit the land, sea and air. Consequently, their uses of sound for communication are many and varied. Bats are nocturnal animals, so when they hunt to for food and to avoid obstacles in the dark, bats emit a type of high-frequency sound waves called ultrasonic waves. They then listen as the sound bounces off the objects, and this is known as echolocation. You I like to come out of the night to bite people's necks. But how, how can I see, I hear you say. It is so dark, but I do not need light, for I use ultrasound. But I can't hear anything I hear you say. Well, because it's ultrasound. Ultrasound has a frequency higher than 20,000 hertz, higher than humans can hear. You pathetic creature. Watch again. The high-pitched sounds leave my mouth. They reflect from the trees. There are echoes. My ears pick up the echoes, and I avoid all the dangerous objects and certain death. I can also use these echoes to detect my prey. Ha! Ha! <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Ah, excellent. Lunch is served. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> very tasty. You see how the ultrasound will make us masters of the night, of the echoes enable us to see in the dark and kill our prey. We will be the supreme rulers of the world, even with my terrible Romanian accent. We are the supreme beings. We will rule all. <laughs> Oh. Okay, so we're going to have a look a little bit further at how bats detect different frequencies to humans and how they use that um, in order to survive. So the first top point that this video is looking at is outline and compare the detection of vibrations by f insects, fish and mammals. So it's just an outline, so briefly describe and then compare the difference in detection of these three groups of animals. 
The ear is one of the most complex organs of the human body and yet it can be traced back to a simple organ in prehistoric creatures. Even in modern jellyfish, it is an organ of balance, although this is a secondary function of the human ear today. The tactile bristles on an insect's cuticle and on its antenna respond to low frequency vibrations. But many insects possess more specialized structures and mechanisms for hearing. The simple of these structures so the simple of these mechanisms consists of the action of sound receptors called sensilla. These are the tactile hairs that vibrate in response to sound waves and in turn trigger nerve impulses. So as we can see here, the sensilla is makes up a hair attached to a nerve cell, and as the hairs vibrate, it creates a nervous impulse in the nerve cell under the skin. Sensilla are present in the male mosquito, for instance, and are sensitive to the vibrations made by the beating wings of the female mosquito. Orthopterans, such as insects, have a tympanum or an eardrum, sorry, a, or a drum, which is similar to the eardrum, on each leg just below the knee. The tympanum is a cavity containing no fluid. It is enclosed by an eardrum on the outer side and a pressure release valve on the other. Nerve fibers are connected to the eardrum and pick up the vibrations directly. Female crickets are deaf to some frequencies and sometimes rely on the smell given off by males as he raises his wing covers to make a call. Both male and female, sorry, butterflies and moths have the tympana, which is plural for tympanum, on the base of their wings. So as we can see here, we have the wing of this moth and underneath there is a small opening covered with a membrane which is the tympanum. Both male and female cicadas possess organs for hearing, despite the fact that it is only the male cicadas that sing. A large pair of mirror-like membranes, the tympana, are connected to an auditory organ by a short tendon at the base of the abdomen. When the male cicada sings, he crinkles his tympana to prevent deafening himself. So the timbal is the organ that they use to create their sound, and then the tympanum is the organ that they use to detect the sound. So because the tympanum is so close to the timbal, in order to stop them from deafening themselves, they squeeze up the tympanum so they crinkle it because it really only detects vibrations when it's pulled tightly. The tympanic organ of some insects can be found on the legs, thorax or abdomen. The hearing ability of fish varies between species. All fish and some amphibians have a lateral line, which is a pronounced pair of sensory canals which run along the length of the animal. Pressure waves in the surrounding water distort the sensory cells found in these canals, sending a message to the nerves. There is a significant link between the lateral line and the true organs of hearing. It has the same type of hair cells and nerves that are found in the inner ear of humans. Some fish actually perceive sounds by possessing an inner ear that has a sensory chamber composed of passages called the labyrinth. It contains an otolith or an ear stone and is lined with hair cells. Auditory nerves detect the differences in vibrations between the hair cells and the otolith. This is recorded as a nerve impulse which is carried to the nerve, by the nerves to the brain. The swim bladder may also play a part in transmitting vibrations to the sensory chamber. In many freshwater fish, such as carp, the transmission may be enhanced by a series of small bones, the ossicles, which connect the swim bladder to the sensory chamber. There are a number of different mammals and they have different ways of detecting frequency, but we're going to look particularly at the killer whale and the dolphin. Killer whales have an acute sense of hearing. The sound is received by the lower jawbone. This contains a fat-filled cavity which extends back to the auditory bulla or the ear bone complex. Sound waves are received and conducted through the lower jaw, the middle ear, inner ear and the auditory nerve to the well-developed auditory cortex of the brain. Dolphins close their ear canals when diving in order to stop water from getting in. They detect vibrations through special organs in their head and some low-frequency sounds through their stomach. Along with this theory dot point, there's a secondary source dot point that says process information from secondary sources to outline the range of frequencies detected by humans as sound and compare this range with two other mammals discussing possible reasons for the differences identified. So before we had to um, compare the structures that the organisms had to detect ranges, and now we're going to actually compare the physical ranges. So you need to be able to remember the actual numbers of the ranges that 
um, are detected by different organisms. So the frequency range of human hearing is limited to approximately 20 to 20,000 cycles per second or hertz in children. The ability to hear high-pitched sounds decays with age and we'll be having a look at why that happens a little bit later. As the syllabus says, we need to compare the range detected by humans with two other mammals and look at possible causes for these differences. Mammals other than humans can detect sound frequencies lower than 20 hertz and much higher than 20,000 hertz. Dogs, for example, can easily detect sound between 15 hertz and 40,000 hertz. They are able to hear a high-pitched dog whistle, which is inaudible to the human ear. The frequency sorry, of sound produced by dolphins ranges from 0.25 hertz to 150,000 hertz and takes the form of whistles and clicks. The hearing range, on the other hand, is from 150 to 150,000 hertz. Bats use a higher range of frequencies. The sound produced is 10,000 hertz to 120,000 hertz, where their hearing range extends from 1,000 hertz through to 120,000 hertz. As we can see in this graph, humans have quite a broad range of frequencies that they can detect in comparison to some other organisms. But if we have a look, a lot of the mammals, so the sheep, the dog, the cat, the cow, all have a fairly broad range of frequencies that they can detect. So we need to have a look at some possible reasons for these differences in frequency detection. So the flexibility in the bacillar membrane of the ear limits the frequency range for human hearing. So we'll be ha having a look at what the bacillar membrane is and its function in a future lesson. But at the moment, we just need to know um, that at the moment, its structure limits the amount of frequencies that we're able to detect. During the course of human evolution, the ability to modify the environment has resulted in less reliance on the sense of hearing for survival. Humans retain effective three-dimensional vision, which eliminates their need for echolocation, like some other organisms. Dolphins cannot rely on vision at all times. They produce a high-frequency clicking sound of about 150,000 hertz. This is a shorter sound wave and is used in dark, murky water to locate objects and to find food. Dolphins also use low-frequency sound known as whistles, but which can take various forms for communication. Lower-frequency sounds will travel further and allow dolphins to communicate amongst themselves. Bats are known as crep crepuscular, which means that they are active in dim light, which is either at dawn or dusk, and or nocturnal, which means they are active in darkness at night time. As a result, they rely strongly on echolocation for navigation and detection of prey. The high frequency sound wave being short produces more detailed messages for the bat about its surroundings. And we saw this in the little video. The bat sends out the high frequency waves, waits for them to be reflected, and the brain is able to transfer that uh, information into what we call a sound picture. This graph is also in your booklet. It shows the difference in frequencies produced and the frequencies detected by a range of different organisms. Remember that for this syllabus dot point, we mainly need to focus on mammals, but it is interesting to note the differences in some um, other animals, in particular the grasshopper, which only detects a very small part of the frequency that is able to produce. So the top line is the frequencies produced and the bottom line is the frequencies detected. So there's only a very small lap overlap with the, um, the grasshopper. However, if we have a look at the dog, Okay, dogs only produce a very narrow range of frequencies. But if we have a look here, we can see that they detect a huge range of frequencies from extremely low frequency waves right through to quite high frequency ranges. So this ability of dogs to detect ranges that are quite low through to quite high will help them to survive in the environment in which it lives, in particular for hunting and for communicating, which is the lower end of the frequencies and also to be able to um, stay away from their predators. So their predators may produce frequencies that are in these higher or lower frequencies so the dog is able to detect them.